Now, it, it doesn't mean, now they had growth and, and recessions and growth and recessions. You can have two or more recessions in a depression with periodic growth. But the point is you never get back to the old potential. I mean, a good example, the Japanese stock index, the Nikkei index in, uh, in New Year's Eve 1989, it was 40,000. Today, 30 years later, it's about 28,000, but okay, it came off the bottom, but it never never made it back to the prior high. It'll never, so, never be. <laughs> oh, I think that's right, it may never yeah. be. Um, and another, another example, in um, October 1929, the United States stock market crashed, every, a very famous crash, yeah. uh, but it lasted for three years, and it, it, when it bottomed in 1932, it was down 89.2%, almost 90%. That's what a stock market crash looks like. But then you ask people the next question and say, well, when did it get back to the 1929 high? How long did that take? Mm -hmm. The answer is 1954. Yeah. It took 25 years yeah. to get back to where it, now it doesn't mean you couldn't make money in the meantime, you could have bought the low in 1932 and made money in 1933. But that, that's what depressions look like. That's the kind of thing we're in. This will be intergenerational. The effects of this will last for not 30 months, but 30 years. Uh, and, and there's very good, very good evidence to back that up. There was a group, it was a, um, an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and two academic economists. And they looked at all of the pandemics in the last 650 years, going back to the Black Death. I, I often criticize economists because their time series are too short. They say they're doing correlations and regressions. I was like, well, no, that's, we need a much bigger time series. Well, 650 years is good enough. But they went back to the 1350s to the Black Death and they looked at every pandemic in which 100,000 or more people died. The fatalities were 100,000 or more. Of course, the two worst were the, the, black, the, uh, the, the, uh, the black Death, the, the plague in the 1350s, and the Spanish flu around 1918, 1919. The, yeah. uh, the Black Death was um, about 75 million dead, they estimate, and the Spanish flu was 100 million dead. And then after that, there were several with, where there were 2 million fatalities and some fewer. They were using 100,000. Well, there were only 15 pandemics in the 650 years where 100,000 or more died. COVID-19, by the way, is going to end up being third on the list. Right now, it, it's right now it's fifth, but uh, we have about we have over 1.8 million fatalities, but it's not under control. Mm -hmm. So you can see that that number is going to go past two million. It'll pass the Asian flu, and there was one other um, influenza in the late 19th century. So it's going to be third on the list. But what they asked themselves, because they're economists, not uh, doctors, and they said, well, how long did it take these economies to normalize mm -hmm. following these extreme pandemics? And the answer is, on average, 35 years, okay. not 35 months. And just to kind of give a concrete example of that. So I grew up in the, in the 1950s, 1960s. It was, it was a very prosperous time in, in the United States. Um, I did not live through the Great Depression, but my parents did and my grandparents did. So I was raised with a sort of depression mentality, even though I didn't live through it. And when we were little kids, you know, nine years old, the, my parents would send us that we take our wagons and go door to door and collect tin cans and newspapers. And we weren't doing it for environmental reasons. It might've been good for the environment, but we were doing it for recycling because all that stuff could be turned into you know, buildings and so forth. Uh, and so, as I say, the, and that didn't change until the late 1960s when the baby boom came of age and then we just started partying and using credit cards and everything else. So it did change, but it took 30 years to change. In other words, the, the behavioral and adaptive effects of the depression of the 1930s lingered through the 1960s. And that, that's my experience, but it's consistent with what these researchers found out. But at the end, uh, when we get to asset allocations, uh, I said, the, the first thing I do is I explain my methodology and explain what diversification is. Diversification is a very powerful tool. It does what it's supposed to do, which is increases your total return with less risk. But people don't understand how to diversify. I run into people, they say, well, I'm, I'm diversified. I own 30 different stocks in 10 different sectors, you know, technology, consumer non-durables, uh, you know, minerals and mining, et cetera. And I say, you're not diversified. You may have 30 stocks, but you're in one asset class called stocks. stocks. So <laughs> when, when stocks are like they'll go up together. I'm not saying they won't go, they'll go up together and go down together. So you may have 30 stocks, but you're not diversified. Diversification is like they have a slice for stocks. That's fine. Gold, yep. cash, yep. real estate, treasury notes, and alternatives. That is closer to real diversification. So uh, in particular, 
Uh, I recommend about a 10% allocation to gold. And people always want to put words in your mouth. They say, well, Jim Rickard says sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't believe that. But a, a 10% allocation, I think, is right. That will, uh, if there is extreme inflation, that will produce gains that are so large, they'll kind of ensure, insulate the rest of your portfolio. Uh, so you're protected that way. And if there's a, uh, a loss of confidence in the dollar or some kind of currency collapse, again, gold will do very well. Uh, I also recommend um, 10-year treasury notes or for the German investor, uh, uh, buns, you know, 10-year buns. Um, and the reason for that is, um, I mean, first of all, they're high credit, they're liquid, but uh, interest rates are going to go lower. Uh, which produces capital gains. It's a little bit counterintuitive. People don't understand bond math, yep. but it's pretty simple. If interest rates go down, the value goes up. So as interest rates go down, you're getting more capital gains. So we have a lot of you know very smart, very prominent people in the United States: uh, Jeff Gunlock, uh, Bill Gross, um, uh, Dan Isaacs, and Pimco, and others who say you know the interest rates are are too low. This is the greatest bond market bubble in history. Short the bond market, etc. One by one, they've been carried off feet first. They've been wrong about that. And the reason is they confuse real rates and nominal rates. So nominal rates, that's the rate you see on television or when you look at a screen, that's the, the nominal rate. But the real rate is the nominal rate minus inflation. And the problem is real, uh, nominal rates are low. That's true. But real rates are not low. I borrowed money in 1980 at 13%. That was my first mortgage. My, my mother cried because her first mortgage was 2%. Uh, but, but I said, Mom, I'm borrowing at 13%, but inflation was 15%. Mm. So my, my real rate was negative 2. Plus, taxes were 50% 5 and my interest was tax deductible. So I got a tax benefit on the money I was paying uh, of 50% on the 13%. So that's another 7%, 7.5%. So my after-tax rate, after inflation, after taxes, my real rate was negative 8. So I was borrowing a 13 nominally, but my real rate after taxes and inflation was negative 8. That's a low real rate. But the point is that that's where we have to get to. If you want to stimulate the economy and borrowing and lending and spending and investment, et cetera, you, got to get, you have to get real rates much lower than they are right now. Well, we're not getting inflation. And we're, eventually we may, down the road we may, but not now. Deflation is a greater danger. So if, uh, if, if inflation is declining, we're getting disinflation and deflation and the nominal rate is here, how low does the nominal rate have to go to get to a negative real rate? What's well, got to go negative? Uh, it's got to go maybe negative two or negative three. That will produce enormous capital gains for the bondholders. All the dominoes never fall at once, they fall sequentially, and sometimes there are time gaps between them, and everyone says, all, all good. Um, it's not all good. You have to look behind the curtain of the international monetary system, understand what's actually going on. Uh, the real problem has to do with tight money. And, you know, uh, interest rates are 5% in March. 2022, they were zero. I mean, people remember Paul Walker raised interest rates to 20%, and he did, but that played out over a couple of years. And the Fed's not done. I mean, they're saying, well, we're going to think about it. We want to look at more data, but they have not said we're done. This whole pivot narrative has been wrong for a year, and it's, it's wrong now. So we have tight money. We have underwater bonds. We have management, bank management, who don't know the first thing about risk management. If you knew anything about risk management, once the Fed said, hey, we're going to, we're going to raise rates until we kill inflation. And that is what they said. Well, if you're a bank risk manager and you hear that, you're like, I got bonds, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. I understand they're unrealized losses unless I sell them if in what's called a hold to maturity account, but they're still losses and it still destroys confidence. Now bank runs today, you know, you don't have to line up around the corner in the rain, you know, with your hat on waiting for to see the teller. You can just do it with your iPhone and to the tune of, you can move a billion dollars with your iPhone if you, you know, with the right accounts and passwords and all that. And so that's what happens. So the bank, bank runs are instant instantaneous and a good analog is the 2008 financial crisis everyone remembers you know september 15 2008 midnight on a sunday lehman brothers files for bankruptcy and that's true but that started in the spring of 2007 uh, when hsbc reported disappointing earnings based on mortgage losses and then came to a head in august uh, two bear stearns hedge funds failed uh, there were high high yield mortgage funds at the end of july august the fed raised a discount rate it took a, a, a full year, another 13 months to get to Lehman Brothers. And what happened along the way? Bear Stearns in March 2008, Fannie Mae went bankrupt in June 2008. 
Freddie Mac bankrupt in June 2008. Congress bailed out the system in August 2008, and then Lehman Brothers. So that took a year and a half, and there are a lot of crises like that. So we're we're in a we're in falling dominoes. It's not over. It'll get a lot worse, and people should prepare for that. But as usual, they don't. They people are very complacent. Wall Street says it's all good, and people believe it, but they shouldn't. You know, I remember the Hirschfeld Bank collapse in 1974. That was a foreign exchange crisis. But through the you know the early 80s with the Latin American debt crisis and the late 80s with the SNL crisis and then 1994 the Mexican tequila crisis with the collapse of the peso 1998 long term capital dot com 2007 2008 you know October 19 1987 the stock market fell 22 percent in one day not a year but in one day so I've I've been on the front lines of all those but the one thing I've noticed is that each crisis gets bigger than the one before. And each bailout is bigger than the one before, and the question I'm asking as an analyst is: Are, are we are, are we at the point where the crises are so big it's bigger than the Fed? In other words, we're not really talking about bailing out a bank or a sector. People lose confidence in the dollar itself, and we do seem to be heading in that direction. And you can think of the dollar and and gold as kind of two sides of the seesaw. You know, one's up and the other one's down, and then vice versa. When people talk about the price of gold, it's really the dollar price of gold. You can think of gold by weight. So,、uh, yeah, a strong dollar usually means a lower dollar price for gold, and a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. And we've seen that dynamic play out in recent months. It's not the only driver of gold; it's one of them. There's a good old-fashioned supply and demand. Sometimes you see in a financial panic, gold and the dollar will both get stronger. The dollar will get stronger against other currencies. And gold will get stronger, measured in dollar terms, because there's a flight to quality. Get me out of you know yen or yuan or rubles or euros or whatever else it might be. Get me into treasury securities. And the thing about a flight to, to quality, it plays out in in security space. You, what you want to get are really treasury securities. You want to get really short-term treasury bills and, and treasury notes. But to do that, you need dollars. If you're a foreign bank or foreign investor and you want to buy some. Four-week Treasury bills. You got to get dollars to pay for them. So the the rush into safe Treasury securities creates a demand for dollars, and then at the same time, gold is another saving. So sometimes it's the seesaw. Sometimes they can both go up at once. I guess、uh, what I'm I'm really saying is that I see gold getting stronger. The the dollar is、uh, very much in the news. It's one of the questions I get most frequently. You know, you talk about Ukraine or China or. Inflation and all that, but it usually it comes back pretty quickly to the dollar. And but I find there's a lot of confusion on the topic. The people don't distinguish between the role of the dollar as a payment currency and the role of the dollar as a reserve currency. And those are two very different things. There's some linkages, but a payment currency basically, if I want to buy goods and services from you,、uh, and I tender some form of currency, and you're willing to accept it, and you're confident someone else will accept it from you, that's a good payment currency. It could be dollars, it could be euros, or You want, or it could be Russian rubles, or Brazilian reais, or or anything, as long as people are willing to accept it, have confidence in it. And you know, when we were kids, we'd use baseball cards and bottle caps. So almost anything could be a reserve currency. You need payment channels, and and there's a little more to it than that. But that's basically it. A reserve currency is a very different thing. First of all, we don't really have reserve currencies. You know, you go to the People's Bank of China. They don't have hundred-dollar bills stacked up in the basement. What they own are U.S. Treasury securities, which are digital, by the way. The last paper Treasury security was issued, I think, around 1979. So what they have are, are actually securities. So when people say reserve currency, what they really mean is securities that hold your reserves, denominated in a currency. So of course, Treasury securities are denominated in dollars, but they don't have actual dollars, you know, in a bank account or in physical form. They own securities. Now, as far as the payment currency is concerned, that's relatively easy to displace. This is what all the news is about. So, Saudi Arabia is talking to China about accepting yuan in exchange for Saudi oil. Brazil and China just negotiated a major agreement where the Brazilians could pay in reais for Chinese exports. Manufactured products, semiconductors. The Chinese can pay in yuan for Brazilian, you know, sugarcane, soybeans, aircraft, Embraer,、uh, and other, and oil and other products from Brazil. The BRICS, you know, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. You know, about a third, which is close to half the population of the world. When you throw in India and China in the same group, they've now rebranded themselves as BRICS Plus. So when they have their meetings, they're inviting Iran, Turkey, Argentina, you know, and a lot of. Large countries, important countries that were not part of the original BRICS, they're they're working on a new payment currency, and that we're likely to see a big rollout of that. Don't know exactly 
what it'll be. They're working behind the scenes. It could be commodity backed. It could be gold backed. I'm not predicting that, but that's certainly one of the possibilities that we need to look at. But again, these are these are payment currencies. Now, when you get over to reserve currencies, it's it's much stickier. It's much harder to displace the dollar's reserve currency because it's not really about the currency. As I mentioned, it's about the securities market. Who has a securities market that's big enough, liquid enough? I mean, you need all maturities of securities from four weeks to 30 years, you know, 10 year notes, five year notes, two year notes. You need primary dealers. You need an underwriting group, which is what the primary dealers are. They also make markets. You need settlement, clearance, distribution, custodians. You need hedging devices, when issue trading, repos, futures, options, you know, et cetera. You need that whole network. We've been building it for 230 years since Alexander Hamilton. Uh, no one else has it or anything really close to it. You know, maybe the Germans and the Italians, but they're not really big enough. And, and above all, you need the rule of law. I mean, nobody trusts the Chinese. Nobody trusts the Russians with their money. So, and they don't even have large sovereign bond markets anyway. So the dollar kind of wins the reserve currency, meaning really securities, crown because by default, there's nothing else that can compete with it. And there won't be soon. I mean, the things I described take 10 or 20 years to build. And again, the rule of law is probably the most important one. Uh, so you're not going to see the dollar knocked off as a reserve currency, so-called by other currencies or other bond markets. But there is one thing that could knock the dollar off, which is gold. A gold is just gold. If you have physical gold, bullion or coins, you don't need all that other stuff. You just put it in a safe place and guard it, you know, like Fort Knox or whatever the Russians and Chinese have their equivalents and just sit on it. It's not digital. You can't hack it. You can't freeze it, et cetera. So the idea of the dollar losing ground as a payment currency is completely plausible. It'll happen in stages and it's happening already. The idea of the dollar losing its role as a reserve currency, it's not going to lose it to another currency, but it could lose it to gold. And part of the reason for that, I always say that foreign countries can't really destroy the dollar, but we might do it ourselves. This banking crisis is far from over. All the dominoes never fall at once. They fall sequentially. And sometimes there are time gaps between them. And everyone says, oh, all, all good. It's not all good. You have to look behind the curtain of the international monetary system, understand what's actually going on. These failures are symptoms more so than the real problem. Uh, the real problem has to do with tight money. Interest rates are 5%. They're going to be, you know, five and a quarter. But that is the uh, a year or just over a year ago, March 2022, they were zero. Uh, so you go from zero to five and a quarter percent in about one year. That's extraordinary. I mean, people remember Paul Walker raised interest rates to 20 percent and he did. But that played out over a couple of years. This is five percent in, in one year. And the Fed's not done. I mean, they're saying uh, we're, we're going to think about it. We want to look at more data, but they have not said we're done. This whole pivot narrative has been wrong for a year and it's it's wrong now. This banking crisis is far from over. What a great news to start our day, eh? Jim Rickard said that the banks will never fail all at once. You have to be cognizant of the situation, like the market condition, public confidence, and of course, the interest rates. One of the easiest indicators of a healthy economy is the interest rates. If the economy is in a red-hot inflation, then the Fed has to raise interest rates in order to cool down spending and encourage the public to save money because they will earn more interest with their bank. The Fed has raised interest rates from half a percent to 5.33% in just one year, the fastest and highest in the history of Federal Reserve. But the inflation hasn't come down yet so the Fed has to keep raising the interest rates. This whole pivot narrative has been wrong for over a year, Jim Rickard said. The Fed will never do a pivot. Pivot means stop raising the interest rate and instead start cutting it down. The Fed will keep raising the interest rates until they bring inflation down. A good bank risk manager will think, the Fed is raising the interest rates, it means the bond price is going down, I think I should sell my bond so that all of my bank deposits will not lose any value because of the bond prices going down, but instead these bank managers do the opposite so people will take their money from the bank. Jim Rickard said it will be worse than the 2008 global financial crisis. Let's hear more from Jim. So we have tight money, we have uh, underwater bonds, we have bank management who don't know the first thing about risk management. If you knew anything about risk management, once the Fed said, hey, we're going to we're going to raise rates until we kill inflation. And that is what they said. Jay Powell gave eight speeches between the summer of 2022 and recently. And he said that every single time. Well, if you're a bank risk manager and you hear that, you're like, huh, I got bonds. Interest rates go up, bond prices go down. I understand their unrealized losses unless I sell them if they're in what's called a hold to maturity account, but they're still losses and it still destroys confidence. Now, bank runs today 
you know, you don't have to line up around the corner in the rain, you know, with your head on waiting for to see the teller. You can just do it with your iPhone. Uh, and to the tune of, you can move a billion dollars with your iPhone if you, you know, with the right accounts and passwords and all that. And so that's what happens. So the bank, bank runs are instant, instantaneous, um, and, uh, and they're far from over. So yes, yeah, a little, you know, kind of in a quiet period, but there'll be more. Uh, and uh, the good uh, analog, uh, Matt, is um, the 2008 financial crisis. Everyone remembers, you know, September 15th, 2008, midnight on a Sunday, Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy. And that's true. But that started in the spring of 2007. Uh, when HSBC reported disappointing earnings based on mortgage losses and then came to a head in August, uh, two Bear Stearns hedge funds failed. Uh, there were high, high yield mortgage funds uh, at the end of July, August, uh, the, the Fed raised a discount rate. It took a, a, a full year, another 13 months to get to Lehman Brothers. And what happened along the way? Bear Stearns in March 2008, Fannie Mae went bankrupt in June 2008, Freddie Mac bankrupt in June 2008. Congress bailed out the system in August 2008, and then Lehman Brothers. So, uh, so that took a year and a half, and there are a lot of crises like that. So we're we're in a we're in falling dominoes. It's not over. It'll get a lot worse, um, and uh, people should prepare for that. But as usual, they don't. They people are very complacent. Wall Street says it's all good, and people believe it, but they shouldn't. Jim Rickards has explained the current predicament that we're in. It's the tight money policy because of the high interest rates. This situation is very similar to what we had back in 2008 when Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac got bankrupt because the Fed is raising the interest rates. It's similar to what we have now, where the interest rates is very high and the banks are hesitant to lend money to anybody. So, how the situation will end? Spoiler alert, it's far worse than you thought. Well, it either ends when, um, uh, well, it can end two ways. One is something like 2008 but worse, just a generalized global financial crisis where um, everybody's getting the money out of every bank, you know, either buying treasury bills. Uh, you know, treasury bills at a brokerage firm are pretty safe because it's not about the brokerage firm. Brokerage firms fail all the time, but they have to segregate uh, house house fund, proprietary funds and customer funds. Um, money market funds, same thing in the sense that in 2008, uh, the, the, um, the government proved that they're willing to bail out money market funds. I mean, and they did, guaranteed every money market fund in the country. So it, uh, the best safe haven is, is gold, is a physical gold uh, bullion, coins or bars uh, and silver. It's not digital. You can't hack it. You can't steal it and you can't freeze it. You just put it in a safe place. So uh, eh, Americans don't really get gold. They don't really understand it. So yeah, I think it's just going to be a question of hopping, a frog hopping from lily pad to lily pad looking for a safe place. The other scenario is that the government just throws in the towel and says, okay, all deposits are guaranteed in unlimited amounts. And I knew people who were trying to get $8 billion out of Silicon Valley Bank on that. Uh, they sent the wire structures on Thursday night. One guy I talked to said, uh, hey, Jim, we, from Thursday night to Sunday, we didn't know where the money was. Uh, we, we sent the wire instructions. We were trying to get it out, uh, but we didn't know what the outcome was going to be, whether it was short or not, wire sent or not. And then Sunday night, the Fed and the FDIC came out and said, all good. We're going to, you know, business as usual, open Monday and it's all good. And he said the money went through, but um, that was what, you know, people were facing and they'll, they'll continue to face. I mean, the, the banks you mentioned, I don't know what their deposit flows are right now, but my guess is they're shrinking fast. People are getting their money out. Um, and so uh, you might just have to give a generalized blanket deposit insurance protection. Uh, and that would stop bank runs in theory. But then now you basically nationalize the U.S. banking system. You look mm -hmm. like Argentina. So there are no, I guess the way to put it, Matt, there are no good outcomes. Either there's a catastrophe worse than 2008 that starts to look like 1931, 32, or the government offers so much protection that they've de facto nationalized the banking system. But the one thing I've noticed is that each crisis gets bigger than the one before, and each bailout is bigger than the one before. And the question I'm asking as an analyst is, are, are, we, are, are we at the point where the crises are so big, it's bigger than the Fed. In other words, we're not really talking about bailing out a bank or a sector. People lose confidence in the dollar itself. And we do seem to be heading in that direction. Jim Rickards said the crisis will get bigger than the one before. In 1999, Wall Street bailed out the market, and in 2008, the Fed bailed out Wall Street. And now, who will bail out the Fed?
Jim proposed the idea of the dollar collapse. People often misunderstand the concept of the end of the dollar as the global reserve currency and as a payment currency. Let's listen to what Jim Rickards has to say. But I find there's a lot of confusion on the topic. And the confusion comes from the fact that people don't, everyone talks about the end of the dollar, or the, the dollar is going away as a global reserve currency, etc. But people don't distinguish between the role of the dollar as a payment currency and the role of the dollar as a reserve currency. And those are two very different things. There's some linkages, but a payment currency, basically, if I want to buy goods and services from you, uh, and I tender some form of currency and you're willing to accept it and you're confident someone else will accept it from you, that's a good payment currency. It could be dollars, it could be euros or yuan, or it could be Russian rubles or Brazilian rice or, or anything, as long as people are willing to accept it, have confidence in it. A reserve currency is a very different thing. First of all, we don't really have reserve currencies. You know, you go to the People's Bank of China, they don't have $100 bills stacked up in the basement. What they own are U.S. Treasury securities, which are digital, by the way. The last paper Treasury security was issued, I think, around 1979. So what they have are, are actually securities. So when people say reserve currency, what they really mean is securities that hold your reserves denominated in a currency. So, of course, treasury securities are denominated in dollars, but they don't have actual dollars, you know, in a bank account or a physical form. They own securities. Now, as far as the payment currency is concerned, that's relatively easy to displace. This is what all the news is about. So the BRICS, uh, you know, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Uh, they're working on a new payment currency and that we're likely to see a big rollout of that this coming August. Don't know exactly what it'll be. They're working behind the scenes. It could be commodity backed. It could be gold backed. I'm not predicting that, but that's certainly one of the possibilities that we need to look at. But there is one thing that could knock the dollar off, which is gold. A gold is just gold. If you have physical gold, bullion or coins, you don't need all that other stuff. You just put it in a safe place and guard it, you know, like Fort Knox or whatever. The Russians and Chinese have their equivalents um, and just sit on it. It's not digital. You can't hack it. You can't freeze it, etc. So if someone said, so the idea of the dollar losing ground as a payment currency is completely plausible. It'll happen in stages and it's happening already. The idea of the dollar losing its role as a reserve currency, um, it's not going to lose it to another currency, but it could lose it to gold. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good. Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So... Uh, so that's like a that's like a you know a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers. Um, or even medium-sized businesses, um, they see it. Uh, uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed. You're not moving anything by truck. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now. And the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business uh, heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clause, clause adverse change clauses kicking in. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards, they stop doing loans, and then interest rates will start to come down. But they, interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun. So uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. Um, and then uh, there's what I call the reality. What I see is, is a kind of a hybrid 
the Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. And they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut. Um, it won't be in April, but you know, rate cut in August, maybe. I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened. They didn't look at the forward indicators I described and they found out too late. Then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, attention spans seem to be short these days, but it was not long ago. Go back and look at look at a chart, uh, any stock index chart from October 1st, 2018 to, to December 24th, 2018. Um, less than three months. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20% culminating in the Christmas Eve massacre, December 24th, 2018, when it dropped, I think NASDAQ dropped like 3% in one day. Now here's the point. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's, you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly, but not just because they're going down. So there may be a pivot, you know, in late August, but, or, you know, July thereabouts, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. But real quick, I guess, let's stick on the recession just for one second, because there's the, um, you know, bad recessions generally come along with, um, with a lot of job losses. Do you see, given that this recession could be worse than most are expecting right now, there being, you know, wide scale layoffs of the sort we've seen in some of the bad, the, the worst, the bad previous recessions like 08, like 01? The answer is yes. First of all, we're seeing it already. Um, so, you know, I don't match the company the exact number, but layoffs on order of magnitude 10,000 to 20,000 terminated employees at Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, um, you know, and other other tech names. Uh, it affects other sectors as well, but tech in particular has engaged in a massive series of layoffs. Um, and so people go, well, wait a second, how come the, it hasn't shown up in the unemployment numbers? Because the uh, the unemployment rate is um, it's around 3.5, 3.6, I don't know exact number. It's right in that neighborhood, 3.5, 3.6. We haven't seen that level of unemployment, that low, that is, since the 1960s. This isn't like oh, a good year or a good debt, you know, this is the lowest since the 1960s. And so, and the Fed is absolutely looking at that. You're right about that, Adam. And they're saying, uh, and of course they believe in the Phillips curve, which is junk science, but the Phillips curve, for those who are not familiar, says there's an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. So if unemployment is high, inflation is low. And if unemployment comes down, inflation goes up. And so if you wanna get inflation down, you should expect to bring unemployment up. That's what the Fed believes. What I just said is nonsense. It's not true. It's junk. 
But the Fed believes it. Uh, again, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the Fed thinks. They say you got to put yourself in their minds to figure it out. So as far as they're concerned, that kind of those kind of unemployment numbers, lowest since the 1960s, that's inflationary. They got to get those numbers up. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights. You know, you know, find a cheaper laundry. Whatever it takes. Um, and then, by the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. So that, and then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, etc. It's a lagging indicator. We know enough right now to know that number's going up this spring. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. Now, having said that, what else is the Fed missing? Well, wages are up 5% on an annualized basis, 5.2% on an annualized basis. I'm like, yeah, and inflation's 7% or 6%. So your real wage just went down one or two points. Because when, when, the, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports those wage numbers, those are nominal numbers. I'm not saying they're fake. But you have to know that they're nominal and you have to subtract inflation to find out what's happening to real wages. And the answer is real wages have been going down for a couple of years because um, they're, they're, it runs around 5% annualized, give or take. Sounds like a hey, 5% raise, what, what do you want? Well, yeah, but with 8 9% inflation or even 6% inflation, um, your real wage is going down. So that's not a, a robust number at all. The Fed, by the way, the Fed wants to make, make it worse. The Fed agrees that uh, those wage gains are too high. But my point is, in real terms, they're actually going down, but the Fed wants them to go down more. That, that's, that would be one way to put it. If you get inflation down and, and wages are constant, then the real wage goes up relative to where it was before. Uh, but if you're unemployed, you have no wage. So that's that's another issue. Now, what the Fed is missing, and it's a long list, but uh, there's something called the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate, you just take the number of people working divided by the total working age population. It's all, it's all you do. It's not sophisticated. Um, and that number today is around 61.2, uh, 60, give or take uh, percent. But as recently as um, 2000, that, that number was over 70%. Uh, and it's come down ever since, and it's, it dropped like a stone during uh, 2020, during the pandemic lockdown. Came back a little bit, but not much. The reason it got, first of all, it's never 100%. It shouldn't be. There are legitimate reasons to be working age population and not working. You're, um, you're a homemaker. You're a, a student. Uh, you're an early retiree. Right. Uh, you're in the military. Yeah. You're in the, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of perfectly good reasons. So it's never 100%, not even close. But 70 is pretty high and 60 is pretty low. Uh, so, and the, the trend has been down. So that leaves, uh, relative to kind of a normalized number, that leaves about eight to 10 million people between the ages of 25 and 54 who are not in the workforce. There's a big untapped labor pool. But if you throw, if you took that group and threw it into the unemployment numbers, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates it, unemployment would be about 9%. And yeah. that's, a, that's a depression level of unemployment. 25 basis points in March. March 22nd is the Fed meeting after that. So those 75 plus the 450 we have now, that'll get you to five and a quarter. And even the hawk, more hawkish members think that that's probably the terminal rate. So um, so Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause um, and then, and then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street are saying no. 
you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause a going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down sooner than uh, uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. Uh, and you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message, why why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to uh, 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. People forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then they took the ceiling off and then things got back to, to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and he and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, and he said this in his last book, just before he died, um, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won, because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger, and then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But, but Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question, so that's the lay of the land. There's, there's the two competing sides. How does this play out? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. He um, His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, don't... Um, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed. You have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. As I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. So they, they think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. They both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Uh, you know, bare shelves and you couldn't get uh, certain things. It, was, it wasn't that every supermarket shelf was bare the way it was in East Germany in the 1950s. But something was always missing. And that's still the case today. 
So of course prices went up and uh, you know people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed and energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called um, a cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. Uh, and basically consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. Um, and so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices because people can't afford it. They, you know, maybe if demand is inelastic, if you got to fill up your Ford F-150 truck with gasoline to take the kids to school or go to work. But if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gas because you're not leaving the house. So, so it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if, if, if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. If I have to, if I used to pay $75 to fill up my tr truck with gas, and now I have to pay $150, which is about right, I'll do it because I got to get to work, but that's $75 I, I'm not going to spend on something else. I'm not going to go out for dinner. I'm not going to go to a show, a concert, or, you know, buy a, um, you know, a, a new, uh, uh, you know, a new camera, whatever, whatever it might be. So it, it does tend to depress, um, demand, destroy demand and hurt the economy. And then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening. But Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still, he's fighting the last war. I hate to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker war. And what he's got looks a little bit more like the Herbert Hoover war that looks a little bit more like the 1930s than the 1970s. So the bottom line on all this is the Fed is going to raise rates at least twice more for the reasons I mentioned. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle is not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there if there is such a thing as the terminal rate. It's another one of these things they made up. Um, uh, inflation is coming down on the will probably continue, but for really bad reasons. The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. The U.S. had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a tr trillion dollars per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre-pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. And I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the, the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator yeah. and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, etc. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last hundred thousand years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. 
who cares? What's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print out the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What what is the problem? Uh, this this comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed. It's wrong. But it's it's got its followers and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they they um, build aircraft. They have uh, benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the Treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be. That that's the, the real source of money. They also take the Treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now that's not legally the case. The Treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. The Treasury is just part of the executive branch uh, and the Fed is an independent agency. Uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, that a lot of people know, some people know that, some people don't, but the, the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate, but, but the theorists ignore that and say, no, um, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have, you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free health care, free child care, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2 Oh, sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but, uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain, my, explain that. Uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay it on debt, but you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You you hoard cash or people were buying gold. They were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must. The government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar fifty of GDP. Uh, now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on me because of the general theory of relativity, but um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, and get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, etc. So now, not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP. 
but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, 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 give it, I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right. Up to a point, Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what, but what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right, the more you borrow, it's actually a headwind to growth. Now you get le- just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry. It, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line, and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. The supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse. Yes, uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse yet. Yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. So um, that, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So uh, not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But um, when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're, they're all they're all a big deal. If, if um, you know, in terms of tragedy, probably uh, the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes, okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like uh, people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is uh, part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a, a that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't uh, miss the fact that all these things are going on at once. The number one question, uh, of course, every, everyone's concerned about inflation, but uh, there's, there's a big backstory there. But I always say when it, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a Ph.D. in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. It's one of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have to take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new jacket or whatever um so there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without so so people get it but then from there the question i get the most is hey jim is this going to cause a recession are we going to have a recession and i use as recently as a few months ago i would say yeah I, i think so you can see it coming late this year early next year now i say we're in a recession I mean, it's not coming. We're in it, and and there's data. I you know I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it. We know that um, the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and, and a few other things, but that's that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, and based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now. It's not severe, but that's like saying I'm in bed with a you know pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a re- we're in a recession right now. Um, there's there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market uh, is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still you know the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, there's institutional support. Uh, this momentum trading, of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. They're the ones really writing these algorithms. I mean, brilliant engineers, but you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. Um, but uh, so, so all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the market 
collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right. So you're expecting a major correction in stock markets. On yeah, the back I'm of not a recession. alone. I mean, I mean that that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they they run, uh, you know, hundreds of billions, uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So you know, so every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me, and I go, well, "How long is your time series?" And I go, "Oh, we took it back five years." I was like, "You know, talk to me if you've done it for a hundred years, because that's a little more meaningful." But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and, and many others. Um, and he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and and other asset classes. So uh, yeah, I do. Uh, that that is my view, but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S and P coming off another twenty, thirty percent. Yes. Uh, and, and again, you remind you have to remind people. Um, Nineteen twenty nine, the stock market fell twenty two percent in two days. It wasn't one day. It was you know it was like twelve percent one day, eleven percent the next day. So twenty three percent over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82% from, from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It, it bottomed in uh, June, 1932, uh, started in October, 1929. So not quite three years, but uh, that fell 82%. And and that happened. So, uh, so yeah, we're down, uh, you know, NASDAQ's down, uh, bounced back a little bit in recent days, down close to 30% down the s p down over 20 percent we're in bear market territory but that that's just the beginning that's not what a full bear market full you know market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that i expect talk to me about inflation because you know i was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit you know i remember being a, just a kid hearing about double digit inflation i could kind of remember the 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 gas pumps you know the lines at the gas it's like a distant memory of me in the 70s and but you know how do you talk to you know younger people these days about what inflation is or it means because i don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an, even a medium term well that's exactly right brian and if you um uh, you know, you're you're a little younger than I am, but I I, I lived through it. I was uh, I, I started my career uh, in banking in 1976, and uh, so I start. I remember my uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking, and the inflation was so bad. You'd get a raise every like four or five months, and you didn't have to ask. They would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if, if uh, they didn't keep up. So she would get a raise and she was making more than I was at the time. So we'd go out to dinner and then I would get a raise and I was making more than she was. So we would just tease each other about that. But that's how it was. Um, and the psychology was, you know, if you needed a whatever, you know, a TV set or refrigerator, new car, whatever, you say, I better buy it now because the price is going to be higher. If I wait a month or two months, the price is going to run away from me. So it, it had huge behavioral uh, effects. Uh, of course, gold was, you know, going to the moon. There, there was a lot going on at the time. But, but Brian, you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years. That is correct. But I remind people, the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10 year period of inflation. That was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, 70, you know, 70 well, between 77 and 81, so that five year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Or is it is it different than that? But I but keep that in mind because the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s, and I'll explain why. But um, uh, well, let's explain why right now because in the 70s, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the uh, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, um, and then the price tripled, but it went from like. You know, two dollars to 
to uh, to to six dollars. Okay, well, you know, percentage terms that's a huge jump, but it was still six dollars. And then it got to twelve. And then in 1979, you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that. And then it went from kind of twelve to twenty. So uh, oil went up by a factor of ten um, in the course of the late 70s for because of two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off, or there's an embargo, or there's a shortage, a natural disaster. A lot of things. It's coming from the supply side, and demand is inelastic, so you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I said, I lived through the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Huh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel, the higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s and had better better spend the money fast because it's it's losing value. Why are those residential real estate prices going up? And, they, and the same thing's happening in the United States. The answer is that there is an exodus, and I don't think that's too strong a word, out of the cities. People are put off by, I mean, cities mm -hmm. have always been a trade-off. Cities are, okay, you have a lot of noise and some dirt and some hassles and maybe a slightly higher crime rate. But on the other hand, you have art and culture and museums and shows and restaurants and, and, and bars. And so you you make the trade-off. You say, I'll accept these annoyances in exchange for all this, you know, culture and buzz. And cities attract, you know, the brightest people. So whether it's uh, you know, bankers or lawyers or doctors or artists, playwrights, actors, whatever, uh, it's just there's a lot of buzz. That's why people go to cities. With these lockdowns, we've amplified all the negatives and taken away all the positives. We've shut the museums, the restaurants, the bars, the plays, the office buildings, things that attracted people. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, again, probably not as bad in Australia as it is here, but crime is on the rise. Murder rate in New York has doubled. Uh, suicide rates across the country have tripled. And that's that's New York, the suicide rates national. Um, there are all these dysfunctions and a lot of them, and of course, when you have highly concentrated populations, which you do in cities, um, a lot of that's where. So what people are doing, and I say people, it's the people who can afford it. They're getting out of the cities and they're going to nearby suburbs or even further out what we call exurbs, which are, you know, the, the next ring beyond the suburbs. And so there is that demand for housing. I'll, I'll, I'd be willing to bet money that the place you're describing is a pretty attractive neighborhood. So they're, they're booming. And the same thing's true in the United States. But what's the other side of that? We're depopulating our cities. Cities are the greatest wealth generating phenomena in the history of civilization. I mean, that's what civilization means. It means cities. And so if we're depopulating and draining our wealth creating engine, what does that do to the economy long run? So for as an individual choice, it makes sense and I understand it. But the macro effect is we're depopulating these wealth generating uh, places. I mean, just take any downtown area. It could be Melbourne or Adelaide or Sydney or, or New York for that matter. If, if there's a, an attractive downtown office building, let's say you're a large company, insurance company, whatever, and you used to have 10 floors as your corporate headquarters. Well, now everyone's been working from home for almost a year. That's that's nothing that anyone would have recommended, uh, you know, a year ago. But we were forced to do it, and guess what? It works. Uh, employers it works. and employees are finding that hey, it works. You can communicate and get stuff done, and maybe it's, there's some attractions to it. So this work from home thing is here to stay. Uh, what yeah. companies will do? They'll say, well, instead of ten floors, I only need two floors, 
and I'll have attractive offices, but they'll, you'll reserve them. You'll call up and say, hey, I need an office two days next week to meet some clients. Done, they'll build locker rooms. They won't be like high school locker rooms. They'll be very attractive. <laughs> You'll keep your laptop and your sweater and your scarf or whatever in your locker. You'll show up, take your stuff out of your locker. Some receptionists will tell you which office is yours for those two days. Set yourself up, meet your clients, go home and work from home. What does that mean? If you cut uh, commercial real estate capacity or utilization by 80%, uh, we'll start with the cleaning crew and the reception. But what about the food trucks, the restaurants, the shopping, the public transportation, uh, drinks after work, um, you know, on and on and on, all the things that are ancillary to that downtown office location, you cut that by 50 to 80%. What is that doing to your economy? So these are examples, and by the way, this will take a year to play out. This is not an overnight thing. Uh, so uh, the tenants are not paying rent. If they are, they've called up and negotiated a 50% increase. I'm, I'm, I have some involvement in commercial real estate and I, I see this in real time. So rents are down by perhaps half or all the way to zero if they're not paying. And everyone says, well, you know, landlords are rich. No, they're not. The landlords take the rents, but they have mortgages. So if the tenants aren't paying the landlords, the landlords can't pay the mortgagee. Uh, and that falls on the banks, right? Uh, except the banks are clever. They've securitized it and sold it probably to, to you and me, right? Looking your, look, we have our 401ks, like a superannuation fund, but you look in the fund and do you have some... Uh, you know, a commercial real estate uh, REIT or something that Morgan Stanley sold you? Well, maybe you do. And what's inside? No one knows, but take a look. Um, so, but that ripple effect I just described can take a year to play out. So we haven't seen the end of this. So the bottom line on all this is that interest rates are going up in anticipation of inflation based on handouts. The reality is the handouts are not being spent, they're being saved, which does nothing for inflation. And it's also not sustainable, which is what are you going to do? Hand out a $2 trillion deficit spending package every six months? Because that's kind of what we've been doing since last summer. And they keep saying, well, this is the last one. It'll be sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's a handout and people need the money. But if they put it in the bank, which they're doing, this is a classic liquidity trap. So what's going to happen? Yeah. But meanwhile, meanwhile, the interest rates are going up, perhaps for the wrong reason, but they're going up. That's going to slow the economy further. We're already seeing mortgage applications dry up. Uh, we're seeing the housing bubble, not bubble, but pretty steep increase in, the, in residential housing starting to level up. So by, um, you know, hard to say, but I would say by March or April, this whole thing is going to go in reverse. Everything we just talked about is going to go in reverse. The economy is not going to have the traction. Unemployment is going to remain high. Velocity is going to continue to drop. There's not going to be any inflation. Those interest rates are headwind. They're going to drop, and the price of gold is going to shoot up. So, my advice to uh, the potential gold investors is: uh, it's on sale. Uh, go get some right now. Uh, it's always better to buy low and sell high. And uh, <laughs> but I would expect the price to be much higher by mid-year. I know that you've said this before, or I'm pretty sure you've said this before: that to stimulate an economy, you need to reduce interest rates by somewhere around three, four percent to have an effect. When interest rates are currently at zero. How can you do that? Where do you go from zero? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the, the short answer is you can't. You, 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 in theory, you can go to negative rates, but negative rates don't work. We have experience from um, uh, the ECB, uh, Sweden, Japan, Switzerland, and elsewhere that negative rates don't work. They're, they're negative rates, but they don't. It's not more of the same. Cutting rates from 3% to you know zero has a beneficial effect, but cutting them from zero to negative one now you're through the looking glass. You don't get any more pop. You don't get any more bang for the buck. And there are reasons for that, which are what, as a central bank, what signal are you sending? Well, see, the idea of negative rates is you're going to spend the money because if I'm going to take it away, you put money in the bank, even at zero, you put money in the bank, you go away for a year, come back, the same amount of money should be there. That's the zero interest rate. But a negative interest rate, negative 1%, you put uh, $100,000 in the bank, you go away for a year, you come back, you only have $99,000 because I took $1,000, that's 1% negative interest. So the idea is if I'm going to take your money, you're going to spend it fast because you don't want me to take your money. Uh, and that's going to have the stimulative effect that we talked about. That's not actually what happens. What happens, two things. Number one, uh, people have lifetime goals. Um, their retirement, their health care, their parents' health care, their children's education, buying a house. There's some large lifetime goal you have, and that's why you save money in the first place. If I'm taking your money away, you're going to save more. 
not less. You you still you still want to achieve that goal. I've made it more difficult, but you're actually going to save more. They want you to spend it, but now you're saving more. And the second thing is, what signal is the central bank sending when they have negative interest rates? Mm. They're saying that they're worried about deflation, not inflation, mm. but deflation. Yeah. So if they're telling me, if central bank is telling me that deflation is a problem, I'm going to wait. And why should I buy anything right now? Wait till the price drops. Um, and by the way, a negative interest rate, negative one percent, my example, is a nominal uh, phenomena. But in real terms, if you have deflation, my money is worth more. So even though my dollar amount may be less, my purchasing power went up because prices went down. And so negative, that's why negative interest rates don't work because A, you're sending a deflation mm -hmm. signal. So people defer spending and B, they have lifetime goals. So they actually save more. So negative rates don't work. So you see, so you're right. You're stuck at zero. There you are. I mean, you can do QE, you can do quantitative easing. Um, and usually what happens is they hand the ball over, I don't know if it's a rugby match or whatever, but they, they hand the ball from monetary policy, which is now impotent, to fiscal policy, which is deficit spending. Uh, but there you have you have other kinds of headwinds having to do with very high, um, very high debt levels. More to the point, uh, in terms of you know what a what a central bank can actually do, they, they can stimulate, they they can print money, uh, and governments can spend money and incur deficit spending. But again, none of it does any good if uh, if people don't actually spend it. And that's a psychological phenomenon. And the Fed or the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, or any central bank can print money, uh, no doubt about it. But they can't change people's psychology. You need, we had an external shock, an exogenous shock in the form of the pandemic that caused people to stop spending, save more, or they were unemployed. Or you know, if you're the unemployed, individual, you're, you're not taking your friends out for dinner these days, uh, you're putting money in the bank. And even if you still have your job, um, you're going to save money because you're worried you might be next. You might be the next one to get laid off or your company might shut down next week or next month. And so you're going to save more. It's what economists call precautionary savings or, you know, in plain English, saving for a rainy day. Um, and that's what's going on. It's going on, going on uh, all over the world.